Well, good morning, Concord. How are we doing this morning? Good. Uh, my name is Aaron, and I have the privilege of serving as one of your pastors here. And so let me say thank you so much for being here at our Claremont campus. Um, and if you would, would you help me welcome in our other campuses this morning? So good morning to our Yona campus. Yes. And also good morning to our Delonga campus as well. Yes. And anybody joining online, we are so glad you're here, and we would love to have you in person if you are able at one of our campuses next week. So Pastor Joseph, the campus pastor, that's weird saying Joseph, I don't ever say that. Um, Pastor Joe, our campus pastor at Yona, is leading a mission trip this week to the Dominican, and so he is not here. And so our lead pastor, Clint, is going to be spending some time at Yona this morning um, because Joe is gone. And so that means I have the privilege of getting to be up here and opening God's word with you, and I do not take that lightly. Um, I always enjoy being up here, and I'm also always intrigued when someone asks me why Clinton does this speak every week, and I'm like, well, that's because that means I get opportunities to teach. And in the weeks that he doesn't teach, he sits down with us, helps us through our sermons, gives us illustrations, helps us study, all of these things that he's doing on the weeks that he's not, and I have been at churches where that is not the case, where you are wanting to learn and there's no one willing to sit down and teach you. Uh, that is not the case here. And so for that, I'm very, very thankful. And so Clint, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, before we jump into our passage, I wanted to make sure that you were aware of something that we have coming up this week. You know, we talk a lot about how we have lots of young families coming uh, that are new to our church. Well, we also have quite a few of... Um, seasoned families that are also joining our church. Um, And so I want to make sure that you know something that we have coming up this Wednesday that is just for you, okay? So every second Wednesday of the month, our Joy Club, which is our senior adult ministry, has a lunch here in our fellowship hall at our Claremont campus. They sing songs together. They eat together. They have a time of teaching. It's a really, really good time with really, really good food. And so if you are in this life stage, they would love to have you at Joy Club this Wednesday at 1130. And that happens every second Wednesday of the month. All right, so we are going to be in week two of our lesson learned series, our Samuel series. So Last week, we were in 1 Samuel chapter 3. This week, we are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, so 1 Samuel chapter 3 last week, 1 Samuel chapter 7 this week. So if you're good at math, like I am, you will notice we skipped ahead a little bit, three chapters, four chapters ahead. So let me, I need to tell you a few things that are important to note that happened in chapters 4 through 6 before we jump into chapter 7, okay? So think of it as like if you're watching a TV show and they're like, in case you missed last week, here's a recap. That's what we're going to do. Chapters 4 through 6, really quick, I'm going to give you some important things that we need to know. So at the beginning of chapter 4, so after where we were last week, we are told that the Israelites are at war with the Philistines, okay? And there is a battle in chapter 4 where the Israelites are defeated, And so they began to ask themselves this question, why has God allowed us to be defeated? Why are we losing these battles? Well, they get this great idea. They're like, oh, okay, well, maybe if we take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with us, then we will win. Okay, pretty good idea, right? So, well, they take the Ark of the Covenant into the next battle, and they still lose. And on top of that, the Ark of the Covenant is taken and captured by the Philistines, okay? So they take the Ark of the Covenant. They think, oh, yeah, I'll definitely win by taking this. They lose again. The Ark is captured by the Philistines. And if you remember, they start, and they start asking this question again, like why, like, why is God allowing us to be defeated in these battles? And now why has the Ark of the Covenant been taken away? Well, if you remember, last week we talked about at the end of Judges, it says, and all they were all doing whatever was right in their own eyes. And so when you think about the state of Israel right now, they are not following God. They took the ark because they knew, they knew it was a representation of God. But instead of relying on God himself, that's all they were relying on was this representation of God. And so it gets taken. All this stuff happens. And in a way... 
when we think about them, the ark was taken when they were in battle, and they were relying on something that wasn't really God. It was just something that represents God. For me, a lot of times I think about that when I'm thinking about people that are only come to church a couple of times a month. And that's it. That's all they do. They come in. They sit down twice a month. They don't get involved in community. They don't study the God's word. And they think that's going to be enough to get them through. In the same way, the people of Israel were bringing the ark thinking, okay, this will be enough. If we have this box, this will be enough. And that was not true. So the ark is stolen. And in that same battle, we see the prophecy that we talked about last week come true. The prophecy that God gave Samuel last week that we talked about, in this battle, it comes true. Okay, So in this battle, both of Eli's sons are killed. Okay, And then when Eli hears about the death of his sons, he basically faints, falls out of his chair, breaks his neck, and dies. Scripture actually says that it was because he was really, really fat and the weight of his body broke his neck. I pro- that's what it says. Look it up. My wife thought that's not what it said. I told her to look it up. It is what it says. So just look it up. So, sorry. Um, so now, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're all judging me right now because I called you out. All right. So we see the prophecy that God gave Samuel last week in chapter 3 come true in this battle. Now, One more thing that I want you to make note of. While the Ark of the Covenant is in the hands of the Philistines, God starts to bring judgment down on the Philistines for stealing it. Okay? So he brings a plague upon the city where it's being kept. And so the Philistines are like, oh, okay, we'll fix this. And they just keep moving it from city to city to city. And then what happens? Well, God just brings a plague to that city. And then he brings a plague to that city. And so finally the Philistines are like, we have got to send this thing back. And so that brings us... To the beginning of chapter 7. Okay? Did we all keep track of that? Yes? Perfect. All right. So, chapter 7, read with me beginning in verse 1. And the men of Kiriath-Jarim came and took up the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of the Lord. From the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jairim, a long time passed, some 20 years, and all of the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Other translations right there say they mourned because it seemed that the Lord had abandoned them. Okay? So the first point I have for you this morning, if you're taking notes, is there are consequences to compromise. There are consequences to compromise. So if you notice... In verse 2 right here, it says that 20 years have went by from the time we see Samuel speak in chapter 3 until now. Now, that's just saying that it's been 20 years since the ark has been returned. We're not even counting all the, like, the battle time, all that. And so it's been a pretty long time before Samuel spoke in chapter 3 until we're about to hear him speak here in just a minute, Okay. So there is another time of silence when the people of Israel are not hearing from God. And so if you and if you read through chapters four and through six, the recap that I gave you, Samuel's not even mentioned anywhere in those chapters. Okay? So at the beginning of chapter seven, we know that it has been long enough for the people of Israel for to think that the Lord had abandoned them. The ark had been returned and still nothing from the Lord. They couldn't hear God speaking, they couldn't see God working, and the people of Israel could not figure out why. How many times is this exactly what our life looks like? We live life exactly the way we want, we do whatever we want, we act however we want, we do things that bring selfish pleasure, that don't glorify God, we treat people like dirt, we neglect the study of God's word, we fill our mind with filth, we do all these things... And then we ask, why can't I hear God speaking? Or why don't I see God working? Well, why do we expect to experience the things of God, to hear from God when we aren't spending time with God? When we're not in his word, when we're not spending time with his people, when we aren't using our life to further the kingdom. There are consequences to compromising our faith. And we see that playing out in the people of Israel here. They are not hearing from God. They are not seeing him working. God seems to be just left them out to dry, right? 
They are experiencing compromises to how they have acted and what they have done. But thankfully, point two, genuine repentance can bring genuine revival. So look with me starting in verse three. And Samuel said to all of the house of Israel, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they served the Lord only. So like I said, suddenly Samuel appears again in the narrative of this story. And Samuel spells it out for the people of Israel. He explains exactly what they need to do and what genuine repentance looks like. And he starts out his thing by saying, if you are. So basically what he's doing by those three words, he is confirming that the people of Israel are way far away from God. If you are, and he says, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away. Okay, so what does put away mean? When you see those two words, what does put away? away mean? Well, it means to wholeheartedly turn away from. Genuine repentance is more than just us acknowledging wrongdoing, okay? It's wholeheartedly turning away from that sin. It's asking forgiveness, leaving that sin over here, doing a complete 180, and wholeheartedly walking in the other direction. It's one thing to acknowledge. Yes, we do need to acknowledge and confess we have sinned. But this doesn't matter if we just keep walking this way. Turn around, walk as far away from that sin as possible. Because half-heartedly acknowledging our sin means we're just going to go back to it every single time. Proverbs 26 puts it this way. Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Scripture is saying that if you consistently return to the sin that you keep confessing over and over again, you are like a dog that returns to its vomit. That's tough. Because when I think about my life and the cycle that I can sometimes get into of confession, turn, go back. Confession, turn, go back. And we see that play out in the people of Israel through the whole book of Judges. Sin reconciliation, turn away, oh, go back. And we see that over and over and over again. That is not the type of life that we are called to live as believers. We are not called to live in this defeated mindset of, well, no, this is just something that I'm gonna have to deal with and something that I'm gonna have to struggle with. No, we have been called to freedom in Christ. That means God sent his son to die on the cross He defeated those sins, which means you can ask for forgiveness, confess them, and turn and walk the other way. He will give you the strength to do that. But we don't. We really want these things over here. We really want to hold on to those things. But we're called to put them away. Put away the things in your life that are destroying your relationship with the Father. Acknowledge them, yes. Confess them, yes. But put them away completely. And as we're reading this story, we see the people of Israel, they begin to do this. In verse 4, they put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. That's what it says. And so we're like, oh, yeah, they're getting it. They're starting to realize they're going to turn away from everything that they have been doing that's against God, and they're going to start walking in the right direction. What happens? Well, we're not going to talk about it this morning, but if you look at chapter 8, right from the beginning, they're like, oh, we want a king. Well, why do they want a king? Because they want to look exactly like the world that they're surrounded by. So they had put away all these gods and idols that they were worshiping and turned away from that only to turn to something else in place of God. Cycle. Break the cycle in your life. Put them away completely. God has called us to live For a higher purpose. And he has already defeated sin and death. So why are we hanging out over here? 
man, I think about the things that I think are such a big deal and the things that I struggle with. And all it's the only reason that I stay over here and meddle is because I'm too selfish to say, hey, you've already defeated this. I'm going to walk in the other direction. Put away the things that are not of God in your life. If you do that, you will begin to see life change in you and your family and in our church. We have to put them away. Third, I want you to see that there is power in prayer. There is power in prayer. Look with me starting in verse 5. Then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered, gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And so the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound and says against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Bethkar. The people of Israel knew the power of prayer. When we look at their lives leading up to this point, we know that they have seen the men of God intercede on their behalf and that they have seen God move and do amazing things because of those prayers. They have seen it over and over and over again. They know the power of prayer. We forget the power of prayer. You know, I think about 21 days of prayer. We, our whole church spends so much time together on our knees every single morning. And we all are like, man, this is going to be, this is what this year is going to look like. I'm going to pray like this every single day. How quickly that stops happening. And it's not because we don't want to do it. It's not because we don't think it's important. I think we forget that we have the ability to have a conversation with the Father for, through a perfect mediator, Jesus Christ. You know, there's a story of a soldier sitting outside the White House and he's crying. And this little boy comes up to him and he says, why are you crying? And the soldier's like, well, I, I'm here to see the president. I wanted to see the president, but it's difficult. I can't get in. And the little boy says, yeah, it is. It's hard to see the president. So he grabbed his hand and he says, all right, come on. So the soldier stood and they walked past the guardhouse and nobody says anything. So they keep walking. And then they walked in onto the White House lawn and they start walking and nobody says anything to them. Well, then they get into the foyer of the White House and still nothing. Nobody stops them. Nobody says anything. And then this little boy and the soldier walk into the office of President Clinton President Abraham Lincoln and the little boy walks up and says, Dad, this man would like to talk to you. Do you realize that no matter what you need, Jesus will take you by the hand, walk you to the throne of the Father and say, this person needs your help. This person needs to talk to you. There is power in prayer. This is why prayer should be the very first thing on our agenda every single day. It should be our first response, not our last resort to what's happening in our life. Why? Because we have been given a perfect mediator. The Son of God made a way for us to have the opportunity to go directly to the Father in prayer. Prayer is not a luxury. It's a necessity in the life of a believer. God hears your prayers. God works. He sees, he hears, he knows what your heart is, and there's power in conversation with God. So, God gave them victory when Samuel cries out to God, and they win the battle. So, after this victory, after they have seen God work, 
when Samuel cries out to God, what does Samuel ask the people of Israel to do? Well, he told them to remember the faithfulness of God. Remember the faithfulness of God. So read with me starting in verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. After this victory that they won, Samuel wanted the people of Israel to remember what God had done. He wanted them to remember that they had cried out to God, God had moved, God had protected them, God had saved them. We need to be doing that in our own life. We need to be remembering the times that God has heard our prayers. We need to remember the time that God has moved in our lives, the time that God has protected us, the time that he has proven time and time again he is exactly who he says he is and he's going to do exactly what he says he's going to do. When you walk out of the room this morning at the doors on your way out, there's going to be a bucket of these. Just regular River Rocks that came from Home Depot. But these stones in your life are going to represent different things for different people in this room. They're going to represent amazing works of God that we have all experienced in our life. And this is what I want you to do with this rock. I want you to put this stone somewhere where you're going to see it every single day. You can put it on your dash of your car. You can put it on your bathroom counter. You can put it on your desk at work. Wherever it is that you're going to see this every single day. And the reason I want you to put it there is because every single day I want you to remember how faithful God has been in your life up until that point. We need reminders of the faithfulness of God. When you look at it, I want you to see it. I want you to remember, maybe there was a diagnosis that a doctor gave you and they said, this is going to be the end. And God miraculously healed your life. Maybe your marriage had been completely destroyed. And God restored and brought healing. That's what that rock, this stone represents for you. Maybe you've had a child that has been far away from God and you've prayed and prayed and prayed and God brought them back and he has radically moved in their life. That's what this stone represents for you. Whatever it is, whatever this stone represents in your life about how faithful God has been to you, you need to remember those things. Remember the faithfulness of God. Remember when he has moved. Remember when he has healed. Remember when he has acted in a way that you least expected, but it was exactly what you needed in that moment. You know, there are going to be days, hopefully not for all of us, but for some of us, there are going to be days where you don't even have the strength to get out of bed. And you're like, how am I going to move forward in this time right now? And you're going to be able to look and remember God is faithful. As every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I want to ask you this morning, what is God wanting to say to you right now? Right here, right now, in this moment, what is God wanting to say? Maybe there are things in your life that you need to put away. There are things in your life that you need to get rid of, confess, and turn Completely the other direction. Maybe you've never even acknowledged the fact that you are a wrecked and broken sinner and you need Jesus to be the Savior of your life. Maybe you need to fall on your knees right here in this moment in prayer because if you're being honest, you don't even remember the last time that you had a conversation with the Lord. And maybe this morning you just need to remind yourself of the faithfulness of God the times when he has moved in your life. Whatever it is for you this morning, I don't want you to waste this moment. I don't want you to walk out of this room 
this morning wishing that you had listened and acted according to the voice of God that you're hearing right now. So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing another song. Whatever the God's asking you to do, whatever is God, whatever God is asking you to say, do, act upon, whatever that is, I'm asking that you do that this morning. He's asking that you do that this morning. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for this morning. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful for the time that you have allowed us to gather together and worship you through song, through scripture, through teaching of your word. God, I pray this morning that you would use this time to remind us of your faithfulness. God, that you would use this time to remind us what you have done, what you have said, the things that you have, the way that you've already worked in our life. God, I pray that you would remind us that there is power in conversation with you through prayer. God, I pray that we would dig deep in ourselves and confess the things that we need to put away that are destroying our relationship with you and that we would turn away from those things this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you most of all for your son. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning?